Hi, I'm John Goldblum. I'm chairman of the Department of Pathology at the Cleveland Clinic. I'm also one of the GI pathologists here at the clinic. Today I wanted to discuss what is clearly our most common consult on our GI consult service, and that is esophageal biopsies. Mostly I'm going to be focused on Barrett's esophagus, but the first case I'll present is a little bit different than Barrett's esophagus, as we'll see very shortly. So this first case is actually from a 27-year-old male who had difficulty swallowing some dysphagia. Uh, eventually um, came to endoscopy after being treated with proton pump inhibitors not having any positive effect. Uh, so I'm going to show you a biopsy from the distal esophagus. Uh, interestingly, this patient also had a biopsy from the proximal esophagus, which looked pretty much identical. So I look at all GI biopsies at low magnification, and uh, every time I look at esophageal biopsies at low magnification, uh, my first question is whether it looks pink or blue. Blue means it's inflamed, something abnormal about it. Uh, pink is usually good, meaning it's typically not inflamed because of all the glycogen in the esophageal squamous mucosa. At low power, this biopsy looks quite blue. Uh, this piece over here looks slightly pink, but most of the other pieces look blue at low power. So I'm going to go up and take a look at this. And really, um, all of the pieces show very similar features, and I'm zooming up right to the high magnification so I can show you the inflammatory cells that are within the esophageal mucosa. These are all eosinophils. There's essentially no neutrophils in here. Um, there's also essentially no lymphocytes, maybe a few lymphocytes, but mostly this is just a really dense eosinophilia. Uh, one of the things that I do when I see lots of eosinophils in the squamous mucosa is to see if I see any organization of the eosinophils within the squamous mucosa. At this point, I'm not really noticing any organization or per particular location of the eosinophils. There might be a slight preference for the eosinophils to be at the surface. You can see that some of these are degranulated. It's very difficult to count eosinophils when you have degranulated eosinophils, but there's very prominent uh, degranulation. Now, just eyeballing this, it's very clear that there is a tremendous eosinophilia within the squamous mucosa. Our clinicians do like us to do counts. If you are asked to do counts, the best thing to do is to go up and look at the biopsy, find the area where the eosinophils seem to be most dense, and count in that location, give an, a maximum number of counts per high power field. You don't need to count five high power fields or 10 high power fields or take an average. Just go to the one area where it's densest and count in that location. Um, just eyeballing this, uh, there are just uh, huge numbers of eosinophils, uh, at least on the order of 50, if not more, eosinophils per high power field uh, with, again, I mentioned prominent degranulation. So how would I sign this case out? Because clearly the abnormality here is related to the eosinophilia. I would simply call this an eosinophil-rich esophagitis and then give a comment uh, saying that uh, the biopsies from the distal esophagus show a prominent intraepithelial eosinophils given an approximate count, which in this case is greater than 50 eosinophils per high power field. I tend to mention whether I see prominent surface layering of the eosinophils or eosinophilic microabscesses. The reasons I do that are because those are histologic features that are quite characteristic, but not pathognomonic of eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, I also mentioned the prominent degranulation, another feature that you uh, often see in eosinophilic esophagitis. I think the key to this diagnosis is the fact that the biopsy from the proximal esophagus, which I won't show you, looked exactly the same. So now we have biopsies in this patient from the distal and proximal esophagus with an eosinophil-rich esophagitis. Now, this is really highly suggestive of eosinophilic esophagitis, but again, it's not pathognomonic, which is why I don't sign it out as eosinophilic esophagitis. Eosinophilic esophagitis is not simply a histologic diagnosis, it's a clinical, endoscopic, and pathologic diagnosis. So I feel that as a pathologist, the best I can do is give a descriptive diagnosis of eosinophil-rich esophagitis with a comment uh, of the features that I mentioned earlier, the fact that it's present in both the distal and the proximal esophagus, and that I strongly favor that this is eosinophilic esophagitis, but it needs to be correlated with the clinical and endoscopic findings. And again, the fact that it's found in both the distal and proximal esophagus is strongly suggestive of eosinophilic esophagitis. Now I'm going to move on to uh, cases related to Barrett's esophagus. This is an interesting one. We get this all the time. I imagine you do too. That is, this is a 56-year-old male uh, patient uh, who had an endoscopy for reasons that were not clear to me, and they had a biopsy taken from the gastroesophageal junction. 
Now, in the absence of knowing anything about the endoscopic features, all I know is they're biopsying from the gastroesophageal junction. So I'm going to go down to higher magnification and take a look at this. Uh, this piece looks like it's inflamed, uh, uh, columnar mucosa, looking at the glands. These resemble the normal glands of the gastric cardia. Uh, this could be um, from the gastric cardia, or it could be metaplastic cardiac type mucosa uh, found in the esophagus. Regardless, the more important point is shown right here in that we see clear-cut evidence of intestinal metaplasia. Those are goblet cells. In my opinion, the best stain for goblet cells is a good H&E stain where you can see that the uh, goblet cells have this bluish grayish mucin on an H&E stain. I don't believe you need to do Alcyon Blue PS stain or any other special stain to document the presence of intestinal metaplasia in this biopsy. So the issue with this particular case is that you've got intestinal metaplasia. Here's a lot more intestinal metaplasia in this biopsy uh, from the esophage esophagogastric junction. This is an interesting histologic finding right here. This is a squamous line duct. This is the duct that drains the esophageal submucosal glands. So we know that this intestinal metaplasia is on the esophageal side of the gastroesophageal junction. But regardless, the point is we don't know anything about the endoscopic appearance of this uh, patient's esophagus. Um, by definition, according to the American College of Gastroenterology, at least one centimeter of columnar lined esophagus has to be present in addition to identifying intestinal metaplasia. Since we don't know the endoscopic appearance, and since this biopsy was taken from the gastroesophageal junction, I would not call this Barrett's esophagus. I would give a descriptive diagnosis of intestinal metaplasia of the gastroesophageal junction, mention that there's no evidence of uh, dysplasia, and then give a comment that in order to uh, call this Barrett's esophagus, one has to correlate this with the endoscopic findings. So the important point here is to give a descriptive diagnosis and to not call this Barrett's esophagus in the absence of endoscopic information. Uh, the next biopsy comes from a patient with a long-standing history of Barrett's esophagus, and like most patients with Barrett's esophagus, those patients undergo periodic endoscopic surveillance and biopsy. And so what they're looking for, obviously, is for the presence of dysplasia. Um, so I'm going to look at this at fairly low magnification because, again, that's what I do in practice. You can see there are some goblet cells here indicative of Barrett's esophagus. Uh, but looking at this at low magnification, there are some areas that really catch my eye. For example, this piece right here really catches my eye at low magnification. And what catches my eye and why? Uh, basically, what catches my eye is the hyperchromasia of the glands and the surface epithelium at low magnification. So even at low magnification, before I've gone down and looked at this at any higher magnification, I'm suspicious that there is some dysplasia in this Barrett's esophagus. Keep in mind that most patients with Barrett's esophagus, that their biopsies are negative for dysplasia. So I always start there with the assumption that a patient's biopsies are negative for dysplasia. And I sort of say, you know, you have to prove to me that dysplasia is present. And typically what I do is look at these biopsies at low magnification. Again, this piece catches my eye at low magnification. I'm going to go up and look at this at higher magnification. And I'm confirming that there is hyperchromasia of the glands as well as the surface epithelium. I don't see any neutrophils that would account for this uh, as being a reactive phenomenon. So I do believe that this is a little focus of low-grade dysplasia arising in the setting of Barrett's. Taking a higher magnification look at the cells, they sort of look like cuboidal cells without much cytoplasm. Um, not really prominent nuclear pleomorphism, but they are hyperchromatic. Again, you can see at high magnification, there's no active inflammation to explain this as a regenerative phenomenon. There's two main forms of dysplasia in Barrett's, one that looks intestinal and one that doesn't. To me, this does not look intestinal at all, and in fact, this has been referred to as foveolar type dysplasia, which is a less common form of dysplasia that one encounters in Barrett's esophagus. Based upon the degree of cytologic atypia here, I believe this is a focus of low-grade dysplasia. I don't think this has the degree of cytologic atypia that uh, is encountered in high-grade dysplasia in Barrett's. Also, the architecture is very simple. So combining cytology and architecture, I think the degree of dysplasia here is on the low-grade end of the spectrum, uh, but I think it's unequivocal, and I would call this low-grade dysplasia of foveolar type arising in the setting of Barrett's esophagus. The last case I want to show you is a, is a more common consult than we used to get in the past. That is, a pathologist uh, sent us this case, and they said, uh, we know this is bad. In other words, we think this is at least high-grade dysplasia, but is it cancer? And uh, surprisingly, it can be quite difficult to distinguish high-grade dysplasia from cancer uh, 
in a biopsy specimen, and on occasion, it's difficult to tell high-grade dysplasia from intramucosal adenocarcinoma, even in an EMR or an esophagectomy specimen. Now, looking at this biopsy, it looks, again, like there's hyperchromasia and cytologic atypia, uh, not only in the glands, but also on the surface epithelium. So at low power, this strikes me as at least high-grade dysplasia. But what I'm noticing at high power are these irregularly shaped glands, infiltrative glands into the lamina propria, but they're not associated with the desmoplastic stromal response. So I don't think these infiltrating glands are in the submucosa. I think this is a little focus of intramucosal adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. Um, This is important in the esophagus because the esophagus does have lymphatic channels in the esophageal mucosa. And even if this is limited to the mucosa, there is a risk of lymph node metastasis with intramucosal adenocarcinoma. It's relatively small. A maximum risk is probably about 3%, but there is definitely a risk of metastasis even with intramucosal adenocarcinoma. Now, importantly, this was actually described as a mass. I don't see any evidence of submucosal invasion here for reasons I mentioned earlier, but I do think this is at least invaded into the lamina propria. So the way we would sign this out at the Cleveland Clinic in the presence, uh, endoscopic presence of a mass is to say that this is at least intramucosal adenocarcinoma and make a comment that although we did not see any evidence of submucosal invasion on this biopsy, the fact that this is from a mass suggests that there could be an unsampled, more deeply invasive component. So that sort of shows you the spectrum of esophageal biopsies that we see in our consult practice, ranging from eosinophilic esophagitis to uh, whether something represents Barrett's esophagus or whether it represents dysplastic Barrett's or even whether there's cancer arising in Barrett's. Thank you very much.